You know, what really makes those moments of unhappiness in relationships is when expectations aren't met. And so that's really what we try to solve for. The stat we all know about 50% of marriages end in divorce, that has been true for the longest time. Of divorced couples, 75% say lack of quality time contributed to that relationship breakdown. Right from day one, we've tried to design it for ourselves. It's probably been more surprising that other people have wanted to use it the way that we've wanted to use it. People are busy. They need to see what each other have on. They need to be able to see the gaps. They want to put quality time. They want to be able to schedule things. Like Those are shared problems. Fast forward five years, where are you and where's your business? A couple will be... The- Hello everyone, Troy Hammond here. That means you're watching or back watching the We Fucking Love Startups podcast. I just want to say thank you back. I really appreciate everyone that's tuning in to watch this. It's been a fantastic journey so far. Season four is bigger and better than ever. We've had a massive audience join us for the first time. And so to you new people, thank you for joining. And for those people that have been here for the whole time, I love you. I appreciate you. It's been fun. And this is you're the reason why we do it. On today's episode, we have a real joy for you. So we have Erica Palmer. Erica is the co-founder or founder of Coupler, which is a powerful like relationship app for couples to help them to find moments, find times, communicate better with each other and go on great dates together. And so it's a really interesting podcast. We go through highs and lows, some of the challenges that she's had with a like B2C app and some of the real highs that she's got. And I definitely feel like couple is one for the future. So tune in and watch it. And we're back in Auckland today because today's episode is sponsored by our friends over at Oxygen Advisors. And for those that don't know, Oxygen Advisors are a team of expert CFOs, finance leaders who are helping early stage and growth companies be the economy of the future, economy of tomorrow. And so they provide accurate, reliable monthly reporting. They do metric dashboards. They help you raise capital. They do strategic advice. They also fucking love startups. And so we're really pleased to have Oxygen Advisors as a sponsor. Kia ora. Thanks for tuning in to the We Fucking Love Startups podcast. Brought to you by Talent Army. Yours is a bit of an interesting career though, because you, you've sort of been more finance and BA analysis before sort of startup entrepreneurial world. Did you always want to get into founding a company or was it? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, my path has been a little non-linear. So um, I've always sort of had some sort of side hustle going at some point um from an early age from an early age yeah come on let's talk about those what what was your worst side hustle as a young kid my worst side hustle as a kid was um making like handmade jewelry and selling it on trade me that's good before the days of ebay and you know online shopping and well not before ebay but um before sort of you know online shopping was really prolific um i was making these terrible designs and um they were actually selling so yeah that was yeah first business you can you can see entrepreneurialism <laughs> early i reckon like people that my my west my west side project was i decided in year seven melbourne's so what's year seven like year 10 year nine here like first yeah, year of high yeah, school yeah. that i was gonna make alcoholic gum <laughs> 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 and so all i did was get gum and pour it pour it in beer and spirits How and did stuff that go? didn't go well didn't go well and i almost got suspended for selling alcohol yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. but it's old <laughs> yeah i don't recommend it as a business model yeah but you now so you've now got coupler right and yep. coupler john and i were actually talking about this before like he was like oh yeah he's like often my wife will pop things in the calendar that i need to do and share like things and he was like well, this is this is really interesting and so i'm curious how did that all come about like how did coupler what was the aha moment like i need to do this yeah so my husband and i so my co-founder is my husband um we were really trying to solve our own problem we were both entrepreneurs we had our own you know different businesses at the time and we'd frequently find we get to you know it's been weeks and we haven't had a date night we were like ships in the night at some point we just couldn't kind of figure out what each other had on Um, we had a shared calendar but it didn't talk to our work calendars and you know and various things were getting missed and and all the rest of it and we were just like you know there has to be a better way but we were too sort of we were too busy to sort of address the problem and my business at the time i'd started an event called symphony um, which is a big stage production orchestra djs playing the biggest dance tracks of the last 50 years and you know, and it, it had just started touring around New Zealand and Australia. And Will's business was 
data analytics for the film industry. Yeah. Uh, and then COVID came along. Yeah, so the events them. and film um, were, you know, the businesses that went first. So um, we found ourselves with a bit more time on our hands to think about some other problems that mm-hmm. we've been wanting to tackle, you know, and that really led us to um, this is the problem that we want to solve mainly for ourselves because we felt like we'd got to a point where something had to change you know we i think relationships are what defines your life and the quality of your relationships um and we just knew that for us there had to be a better way so um what better time than to use the downtime COVID afforded us to start thinking about it that's kind of the opposite of what most couples did in COVID. most of them screamed and yelled at each other and broke up and you guys guys (laughs) yeah we um yeah i guess COVID sort of uh, acted as an amplifier of relationships so for really good relationships they were only going to get better um and for bad relationships it definitely supercharged that sort of um you know break (laughs) point but yeah and so if you were describing couple to a VC firm right now like what would be your sort of elevator pitch in terms of how you describe it yeah our elevator pitch is that um, coupler creates more connection and happiness in relationships by removing the friction that couples experience when trying to coordinate their everyday life yeah. um, you know and we do that in a number of ways so first of all we have a suite of utility tools um, that aims to streamline time and tasks so a, you know, at the core of that is a shared calendar, which pulls together all of um, my, my calendars next to all of my partner's calendars and then highlights where the gaps are. Um, a shared to-do list, which you can as- assign tasks to one another, um, share lists, um, chat functionality. And then over the top of that um, is a whole lot of um, sort of smarts and planning tools around quality time. So our real insight with Coupler was that if the you know if the base of the everyday is taken care of that couples will have more ability um, to focus on each other mm. um, that's a really emotional product for couples though right like how do you go about testing that and you know validating that product validating that it does what it says we're going to yeah. do yeah it's a really interesting question and it's something that we got a, a little bit of pushback i guess when we were originally talking to vcs going i get what the problem is you know they would understand what the problem is that we're trying to solve mm. you know we all know relationships are really hard and we all know that date you know couples are, are busy and date nights are better you know, make relationships better and we all know that and then i you know they got the product that we were building but the leap between the product and what we were the problem we were trying to solve was sometimes a little bit hard to get. Mm. And and it was one of the things where like, we have to validate that this actually does what we say it does and that it, um, it achieves, you know, addressing the problem. Um, and so end of last year, we partnered with um, a researcher from the University of Auckland, um, Dr. Jessica, Jessica Maxwell. Um, she's actually based in Canada now at McMaster University. Um, but she designed a survey where we would ask our where we asked our users a bunch of questions, really trying to get to the crux of what is the impact that coupler has had on their relationship. And the results of that came back like just astounding and better than we could have ever hoped for. Um, I think 75% of couples say that um, coupler has reduced stress and friction in their relationship. That's 70%. 75%. That's yeah. huge. Huge. And 70% say that it's increased the amount of quality time that they spend with their partner. And so just on those two data points, we were like, this is, we're on the right track. Yeah, sure, yeah. Um, And it was such a huge boost for us on our journey. Yeah. So how do you take, how do you take a product like that to market? Like, talk me through like your go to market strategy on that. Yeah. So the beautiful thing about apps is that there's this shop front that is just available to us immediately. Um, and we're built on two platforms, iOS and Android, um, primarily focused on iOS, but um, we were in a position where we could just release on the app store and then suddenly we could be in anyone's hands. Mm. Um, and we've got um, paying customers in 180 countries now, um, uh, most of which are in the US, so about 60% are in the US and then um, the UK and Australia second and third. Why, um, why is it so many in the US, do you think? Busier lifestyles? Or? Yeah, I think the US, people in the US are just inherently a little bit more busy. There's mm-hmm. a lot more travel for work. People don't think anything of, you know, um, because the US is so big, yeah. um, people are traveling for work all the time. If you've got kids, the kids are 
a lot more over-programmed with extracurricular activities. Um, and it just, I think they're a little bit more advanced in terms of um, using technology for their relationships. So, yeah. um, you know, 40% of all marriages now out of the US have started on a dating app. And so there's that stigma around using technology to help your relationship is, is somewhat removed. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that it's just resonated with couples in the US more so than in New Zealand. Yeah. Um, we did actually do a concerted effort to release the app in New Zealand, but on our launch day, <laughs> the second wave of COVID hit and it oh, just, um, yeah, we actually got COVID on the day and had to send our entire team home. Happy launch day. Oh, Everyone's wow. isolating for 10 days. Um, that must be like a <laughs> metaphoric bird shit being good luck though, right? <laughs> so, yeah, I, I'd like to think so. That's what I, how I tried to paint it at the time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I'm not I'm not entirely sure whether it was just timing. Um, I think it was, you know, I think it's a bit of both timing and perhaps the market not being quite where yeah. it is in the US. But what we found is um, like a lot of green shoots coming out of the US in terms of, you know, positive feedback from customers. Um, and so that's just where we're focusing our energy now. Yeah, and I think I'm an Aussie, so I, I can probably say this um, objectively. Uh, Kiwis and Aussies uh, tend to be a little bit more emotionally stunted, you know, in terms of like doing something better about trying to build relationships. And I think it's and it's coming on a lot faster now with like we talked about podcasts off air and psychology and like a lot of people are starting to think about this a little bit more. But it, it feels like relationships, you only work on them a lot of the time when it gets to a point of friction where you have to and mm. you're not, not helping yourself to getting to like to not getting to that stage. And so this sounds like a product to me that. Um, you know, as a, a, um, a guy who's divorced, would have been a good product years ago just to like find those pockets and moments and share your life with someone a little bit more. Yeah, 100%. Um, we, yeah, so true. There's a really interesting stat. I mean, we all know the stat around the number of divorce, um, marriages that end in divorce. Yeah. I've actually been through one myself, so um, and so has my husband. So we were really determined to make, you know, this marriage would be our last. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't want to do that again. Um, But, you know, the stat we all know about 50% of marriages end in divorce, um, that has been true for the longest time. But what we found was really interesting when we were doing our um, market validation was that um, of divorced couples, 75% say lack of quality time contributed to that relationship breakdown. Mm. Um, And so that really, you know, sort of has exacerbated our reason for being that we Mm. knew that that quality time is so important and we had to try and solve that. I think um, what we, we'd always sort of um, wondered whether customers that were coming to our app were in good relationships or whether they were sort of, or whether we were the ambulance at the bottom of the Mm. cliff. Um, And what we found out from that study that we did is that um, these are couples that are actually in pretty happy relationships already. So pro- um, proactively trying to make... And they're proactively trying to make their relationship better, which for us is a lot better for things like retention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed, indeed. Um, and it means that you're able to talk to people in a really positive light. Um, you know, you're not sort of trying to tr- um, solve these really big, hairy issues that have snowballed. It's really like that pro- proactive approach. Yeah. So let's dig on that. Like a lot of people that come on the podcast are better be. This is obviously a consumer app, which comes with a lot more well, complexity and, and challenge and different challenges, right? Different so challenges, yeah. Is that a space that you played in before, like in the beta, beta C space? or? Um, well, yeah. I mean, Synthony was yeah. obviously a big consumer brand. Um, it's totally different. Yeah. Um, but... At the crux of it, it was about creating moments and connection with people. Um, You know, some of the best moments of people's lives are at live events. Mm -hmm. Um, And for me, that was always, I always found that that moment of connection and that moment where you create a human moment that's memorable and and something that's really special between, you know, two individuals or a group of people. Um, That for me has always been a driver. Like, that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. Mm. And so... I guess in that light, coming into Coupler, it's quite similar. It's about creating that connection between a couple. Um, I don't. Th- I think the challenges with B two C tech are different, obviously, mm, yeah. <laughs> um, to an event. But in some ways, it's you know there are a lot of similarities. Uh, it's all about 
you know, I, yeah, I think there are different challenges around getting people to part with their own cash. Yeah. People are, um, you know, you're not spending a budgeted amount of money. Um, you're spending your own money that you've earned. And so the hurdle to get someone to do that, I think, is quite high. Mm. People's expectations on what you're delivering, um, you know, are just that much higher. And I and I would never take for granted that we've we've taken someone's money from them. You just want you want to make sure that what you're offering is is real value. Mm. Um, and there's a real element of putting yourself in your user's shoes every single day. Like what um, what is the value that they're getting from your product? Um, what are they going to remember you for? What can they what can I do better for them? Yeah, it's, I feel like the motivation is slightly different. Mm. Do you use it on it? Yes. Yeah, every day. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> what do you what did you find about using it that you didn't think about at the start? Oh, I don't know. Um, you, you obviously thought a lot about it like in terms of what the application was and there was nothing that surprised you using it. In terms of what surprised me about using it, I mean, I think right from day one, we've tried to design it for ourselves. Yeah. Um, and I think it's pro- it's probably been more surprising that other people have wanted to use it the way that we've wanted to use it. Oh, good. Yeah, we actually... You know, initially we were working with um, a separate UX and UI designer, um, and we ended up bringing that all in house. And I'm not a designer, but um, between myself and the engineers, we've managed to sort of design act- actually out the full app because we re- we've really understood the problem that we're trying to solve. Mm. Um, and yeah, we've just we've so we've built it for ourselves first. Um, and then obviously we've been able to validate with our users whether or not it's working. But I think at the core, um, you know, those core pieces of functionality, they all sort of address really common problems. So people are busy. Mm. They need to see what each other have on. They need to be able to see the gaps. They want to book quality time. They want to be able to schedule things. Like those are shared problems amongst, um, you know, a a lot of adults. <laughs> yeah, 100%. No, yeah. Definitely so. And so you haven't come from like being a tech founder, right? And no. so what was what was your journey like getting into being a tech founder? Are you Were you confident sort of going in or were you... No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, well, I must... I feel... Um, we worked with... Um, how our app was built was um, we had all of our sort of... Um, the back end in ha- um, in house, so ex Movio yeah. um, engineers, um, and then we outsource the front end build of the apps. Um, and I'm sure, you know, both of those teams were looking at me like I was <laughs> <laughs> growing is- horns some days. It's like, uh, what? What is that stupid question she's asking? So the learning curve was super steep. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I loved it. I think. Um, where I've always been strong um, and the value that I've brought to the table is I'm an advocate for the customer. Mm. Um, And so because I'm so passionate about delivering to the customer and the value that the customer is going to get out of the product and I know this problem inside out, like I feel the pain of this problem on a daily, that being in that position and being able to, yeah, just really... Um, fight for what the customer needs that is so valuable and even if I didn't totally understand everything that was happening um, at the time I was able to ask the right questions and be curious um, about every part of the process and just and really make sure that we were making decisions that were not only smart and efficient from a business perspective but that we're going to really make sure that we're addressing the problem that we sought out to solve. So how far along on the journey are you now? Like have you pre, pre-capital, post-capital, like talk us through? Yeah, so we originally did a friends and family raise back in, what are we now, 2024? Um, 2021, um, we raised about a million bucks to... That's a pretty good friends um, and family. Yeah. <laughs> um, we also, we did have a VC come on as well. Yep. Um, and so that really kick-started you know, our development journey, we were able to hire a few people and get an MVP out there. Um, We released two versions of the product in market. Um, One was in New Zealand, 
based around date ideas and um, and really connecting couples with experiences. The product was absolutely beautiful. Um, you were able to see all of the latest events that were on, um, restaurants that you could go to. Um, it would match what was available with when you had date night booked um, and what your partner wanted to do, so their preferences. Yep. Um, and you could make a booking end-to-end in, in sort of one click. Um, absolutely beautiful product, but not really conducive with um, the environment at the time. <laughs> <laughs> the dirty C word. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then at the same time... Would you go again with that? Would you push it out again? Yeah, yep. I feel like that would be in the States, especially. Like, Yeah. That, that would go well. We would do it differently. Yeah. Um, the way that we had built it was wasn't scalable mm. um you know the way that we were kind of scraping data together we had um will's kids and nights and weekends yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> trying to um you know load up all the metadata and, and that was just for auckland so it was you know it wasn't a particularly scalable yeah. product uh, it was beautiful and we learned a lot um but at the same time we had launched this very basic just utility um, component in the US um, and we were starting to see that organically grow without us doing anything at all so um, we we burnt through that money in about 18 months and then we realised we needed to do something differently yeah. um, the product in New Zealand wasn't working um, the capital markets had sort of taken a turn for the worst mm. um, and we were struggling to sort of um, raise again because yeah. we hadn't really proven what we said we were going to prove and although we had some really green shoots and we were really optimistic um, I guess VCs didn't see it the same yeah, way yeah. we did which is often the case yeah. um, and so we put a paywall over the app um, and really went doubled down on the utility component mm-hmm. globally um, we pulled the date feature out of New Zealand um, and we started generating revenue. So that was about 18 months ago. Mm-hmm. The, the learning curve from when we turned on the paywall um, to where we are now has just been absolutely huge. How nervous were you when you did that? I I don't know if it was nervous. It was a, it was we were past nervous. Mm-hmm. We If we didn't do it, we were going to die. So yep. we, we had to do it. Um, and we were pretty sure that we were we were right. So, um, yeah, it was a case of necessity, but also understanding that I think, you know, we've really got something here and, and we do think people are going to pay for it. Yeah. It's always a challenge in apps. Um, you know, it's I think the tides are turning. Definitely the pay sort of ecosystem in, in Apple is a, is a lot more advanced than it was, say, five years ago. Yeah. Um, but people do have an expectation still that they get the technology for free, yeah. which is just, it's mind blowing to me. <laughs> that, yeah. um, you know, how much effort and resource goes into building these beautiful products and the expectation is that they're free. Um, but we, yeah, we launched that paywall and then we gradually started to get more revenue. Um, we were able to put in a little bit more of our own capital. And then once we got to a place sort of middle of last year, um, we did another smaller round um, with the traction that we had. Um, and now we're in a position where we can sort of tick along indefinitely without needing to raise capital. We've got enough revenue coming in. Um, what we're working on now is sort of the next phase of product. We're calling yep. it, you know, the revolution moment um, yep. where we start to f- create more connection for couples, either to experiences in a more scalable way or to other couples, um, you know, in, within their own network. Um, And that's sort of the next phase that we're working on. And the next raise that we do um, will be all about pouring fuel on the fire rather than keeping the lights on. Well, my mind instantly goes to, as a guy who has, as I said, um, single dating apps, (coughs) right? Like dating apps are great, but then once it gets to the conversation stage and organising dates and the likes and then going on the next journey, is that a life cycle that you can tap into, like from the apps, from the dating stage to then the relationship stage? A hundred percent. So, yeah, and we've had some quite interesting conversations with some of the dating groups. You know, a date, an idea or a metric that the dating groups use for whether they've been successful or not as churn. Yeah. So if someone leaves their product, they've done their job properly. Yeah. You know, and we all know Hinge's tagline, the app designed to be deleted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, there's a really big opportunity to um, capture some of that market. Um, and I, you know, I think it's a really natural progression for people. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you what you shouldn't do. Okay. This is from learned example, learned past, is you shouldn't 
be really, really busy. And when you're trying to organise a date on a dating app, send someone your calendly, it doesn't go down well. I can tell you that from no. first hand experience. Yeah, yeah, we were like back and forth trying to find a date, and I was just like, "This might work. Here you go. Here's my calendly." And she was like, "I can't believe you just sent me your calendly." Yeah. But, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And same with Couplo, you might not want to request for access to their calendars <laughs> in a week. Yeah. Um, we did have that. Um, we tracked deletion requests from users and um, we did see that one come through um, that a user had asked um, their new partner to share their calendar and she dumped him. <laughs> yeah, that's an awkward. <laughs> That's awkward. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, it is typically a product that kind of sits, um, you know, when the couple have been together for, so I, I'm assuming sort of six months on yeah. onwards. Um, but I think there's probably an interim step there where you could still use a lot of the functionality, um, but not necessarily reveal all of your sort of personal details up mm, front. No, indeed, indeed. <laughs> so what excites you then going forward? Like, what are you thinking about now? Um I mean, I'm just so motivated about our purpose um, and the fact that we've had some really solid validation Mm -hmm. um, at this point just has been, you know, like the encouragement that we really needed to um, keep going on our journey. And it's it's really exciting where we're at at the moment because we've got capital, we've got revenue coming in, we've got a really great team and we're in a position now where we can kind of take our time and really think about what is next and what's going to change couples' lives and Mm. what is going to really add a whole lot of value. I think the um, sort of core product is, I won't say finished because nothing, you know, software is never finished, Um, but it's in a really good place where we know that it works, we know that it's delivering what it needs to deliver um, and we've kind of got this window of time where we can start to think about the new exciting features and, you know, to your point earlier, bringing back date night yeah, um, nice. because, you know, calendar is not this, it's not a sexy problem to solve, like no one's going to get excited about, yeah, you know, yeah. that, but it is re- it's been really, really important to solve that first because that's the thing that people use every day that's the thing that has to be in order before we can start, um, you know, doing the fun stuff. And I think that's probably what we missed the first time around was when we released in New Zealand, we didn't really understand that we had to solve this kind of underlying issue before we were able to start Mm. to think about the date nights and all of, you know, the, you know, the cherry on the top kind Mm. of um, features. So we're in a position now where we have the luxury to sort of start thinking about those things. Um, yeah, and it's it's really exciting. Awesome. Have you like? I'm curious to talk about like you being a female founder, right? And the reason why I'm I'm curious to talk about this is there's been a lot of news and a lot of things going like on LinkedIn and on the internet these days about how much harder it is for a female founder to like raise money through VCs. John and I we have another podcast, and we did a podcast the other day with a group sitting and. One of the ladies was just so happy that there was another lady at the table. She was just like, I think this is one of the first times I've been in a room where there's like been two people speaking. And and like, and it's always like through male ignorance, right? You're just like, oh, fuck, you know, I didn't like it. I didn't realize that was such a bad thing. Um, But it is fundamentally a little bit harder. Do you find that or have you just found that it hasn't happened yet? Or what's like talking through your experience there? I don't think our experience with raising capital had anything to do with whether I was a female or not. Yeah. I think that it was more to do, you know, like we had a, we they took a lot of meetings. We it wasn't, and it's not even necessary. They didn't get the product. We took a lot of meetings. We got a lot of no's. Um, it's more because I think when you think about the metrics for consumer, they're yeah. really scary. Um, and the New Zealand success story is B2B SaaS. Yeah. You know, and, and if a VC is understanding that they can't add value or this is not a space that they've played in before or, um, you know, I can understand why it's not appealing. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, you know, this, the scenario is I'm going to build something that's going to cost roughly $2 million. Um, our customers are only going to pay us $5 a month. And every of every customer that you acquire, 60% of them are going to leave you after six months. And that's considered good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and so the numbers start to get really scary. And although um, the payoff can be massive, you know, this is the same product that is available globally, um, you know, and and we're available in every single, you know, 
every country in the world basically from day one. Um, so the opportunity is huge, um, but it comes with a lot of costs. It comes with, um, you know, just a lot of difficulties. Consumers are really hard to crack. Yeah. Really no, hard. Indeed. indeed. Um, we're getting people to pay us such small increments of money. There's not an opportunity to go to a customer and, you know, have a hundred thousand dollar contract. So it just, yeah, it's intimidating. Would you? I think. Like, would you move to the states? Because obviously, that's where a lot of your lion share market is. Yeah, I think. Um, from a customer perspective, it's not as important to be there on the day on a day to day basis. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to connect with our customers all the time, um, but we can do that over Zoom. Um, we just recently invited our customers to um, book face to face interviews with myself and Will, um, and they booked out you know within a couple of hours, and so that was a really amazing experience to get mm. to talk to our customers. So from that perspective, I don't think it's necessary. Where when I where I do think it is necessary is when we do go to do that next race. Um, you know, I think although everyone likes to say everything's moved online, I, it is, I still think that raising money is in person is yeah. a lot, particularly with the type of business that we're trying to raise for, um, you know, a couple based in New Zealand, so far away for <laughs> we We've done four podcasts today and yeah. every, everyone has said that for what it's worth. Yeah. Like every single person has said, you, you just can't beat chatting with VCs no. in person and yeah. seeing, seeing someone's eyes when you drop a point or not. A hundred percent. And I think um, the other thing that is really great to get from being in the US is just your finger on the pulse of what the kind of mood is, um, what the trends are, um, what the general sort of feeling in the community is. Yeah. Um, I went to South by in Austin last year, so this time last year actually, and that was just like, you know, amazing to kind of get a gauge on how everyone is feeling, what are the emerging trends, you know, what are the things that we need to be considering, um, and just those conversations that happen as you're sitting next to someone at a cafe that don't necessarily happen here, and particularly for our industry because um, B2C is... You know, it's not as prolific as it is in the US. Mm. Um, in fact, it's not really prolific at all. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think um, to answer your question, yes, we will go up to the US probably next year, um, anywhere from sort of three to six months. I think just to really start to build out those networks as we think about, um, you know, doing our next raise. Yeah, it's obviously something like it's a real passion of yours, which is I think is if you're an aggressive founder, like not an aggressive founder, but if you're aggressively going for that that goal, like you need to have that just like continuous like arrogance that you're going to crack this and you're going to do well. Like kind of chatting with you now, like reminds me, I'm not sure if you've heard the Airbnb podcast story on how I built this. Yeah, And he I talks have. about, yeah, yeah, like he talks about, hey, did we, he fucking built cereal, right? Like he made cereal. To then Obama O's. Yeah, so good. Right? Like <laughs> so I, good. And he raised money off that, which yeah. essentially kept the business going. But he yeah. just fundamentally had this crazy idea that no VC wanted to hear about. Like it yeah. was, he knew it was going to be good and it just kept going. And I feel like that's the vibe I'm getting chatting with you. Like, you know that it's good. I know it's good from past experience and what I'd want going forward. And you're just going to keep making consistent growth until you get there. But yeah, it sounds like you're, 100%. you're and I, out of the weeds now, right? Um, we're out of the are we going to die phase, which <laughs> is a really nice place to be because yeah. that was that was grim yeah. <laughs> for a while. Um, what keeps you up awake now? Like what what keeps you awake at night now? I think um, thinking about growth. Mm. Yeah. Now it's just about uh, can we grow fast enough? Yeah. Um, can we sustain it? Can we? Um, what are the new things that we can try? Um, to help us get there. Do you do you still wear the product hat? Because it sounds like you've been integral in product from day one. Yeah, and yeah. So I sort of I wear two hats. Um, so I think customer and I think of it as customer, mm -hmm. um, and it's sort of setting the tone for marketing. So how do we talk to our customers? Um, and then product. What are the things that the customer really needs in the product? Yeah. Um, and then my co-founder and husband um, will deals with product from like an engineering and execution standpoint yeah. so yeah that's sort of had the division of roles there yeah and how do you like uh, I've, I've seen a few people that are co-ceos right or co-founders um and recently like on podcasts we've had a couple of people that have been like husband and wife and co-founders yeah. and i've heard 
really good stories from that and I've heard some bad stories from that as well. Mostly good, if I'm honest. Like yeah. most of the feedback I hear is I couldn't have done this without my person, you know, yeah. like sharing the ride with them. Is that how you feel? Or yeah, is- oh, 100%. Yeah. yeah, particularly in those, you know, trying times <laughs> um, where, you know, no, I mean, no one knows what you're going through as a founder like your co-founder. Mm. I think you take that to the next level when they're also your partner because there's no filter. Yeah. Um, and so, you yeah, know. Real conversations. Real conversations. Um, I think the trying part of it has been for us um, not switching off. Mm. And so there have been some, you know, mornings where I might have been awake at night churning over something and the alarm goes off at five o'clock and I'm like, hey, are you awake? Can I, have, can I talk to you about this thing? <laughs> um, and, you know, and so a lot of our conversations are sort of are taken up with work. We're working from the moment we get up a lot of the time until the moment we go to bed. Um, but we're both really passionate about it. So mm. that's been great. I wouldn't, you know... If I wasn't spending this time with um, Will doing it, I'd be spending it with someone else and it just wouldn't be as fun. So, yeah, um, yeah it's been really – it hasn't – I'm, you know, I'm not going to lie and I'm sure any other husband and wife team would say this, that, you know, it has its moments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like everything. <laughs> as yeah. well, like everything. But I think the, up, the upside outweighs the bad. So. Yeah. And are you now – like you, we talked earlier about you, like – not being a tech founder, getting in there and having to figure out things along the way. Do you now have you? Do you now have confidence with the next wave now? Like, hey, I've got this now. I feel like I'm I'm able to sort of go forward and make decisions without feeling imposter syndrome. Um, I th- yeah, imposter syndrome. Yeah, I. It's a funny one, right? Because I'm not. Does that ever go away? Well, I don't know. <laughs> not yet for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I think you just start to feel it in other ways because yeah. um, it's like, oh, okay, I can make a decision now about um, you know what we might build le- next or what we might test. But now we've got all this revenue and I'm managing this business and I've got something else to be yeah. <laughs> feel like an imposter about. Um, but yeah, definitely. I th- well, yeah, and I think as well, I'm not relying on myself to make all the decisions, right? I'm really confident in the people that we've got around us. Um, we have an amazing team. And so there's not that pressure to feel like everything is resting on your shoulders anymore. Mm. Um, for me anyway, you know, I think we've done a really good job of getting everyone behind the vision. And so with everyone in the business knowing what's important, it means that they can make decisions and, and they're going to be the right ones. Yeah. When you're marketing like a consumer product, right, like you have to look through a different lens. And so like do you – can you get a bit more creative when you're marketing, when you're marketing directly to people versus customers versus companies or do you have to be really like tuned in on what they're looking for? Yeah. I mean marketing's an interesting one because we haven't – I wouldn't say we haven't done any because that's not, I mean, everything that the customer sees is marketing in some yeah. um, point. I'd say we haven't done a hell of a lot of paid marketing. Mm-hmm. We have really focused on being where customers are searching for a problem. Um, and so really focused on things like SEO and um, and blog articles, which are still extremely powerful for mm. anyone doing consumer. And so in that case, we're just trying to talk to people like we know the problem that you're trying to solve Mm. um, and we have a way for you to solve it. And that's really, we've really approached it from like a practical standpoint. But yeah, I mean, I think really trying to understand what is it that your customer is coming to you for is really key. There's a really, um, you might've heard it, the famous 3M story about the guy who buys the hammer. Um, And he's not buying a hammer to hammer a nail into a wall. He's buying it to get his wife's approval and, you know, her affection and her love and all the rest of it. Um, and I think under, making that connection and asking the five whys. Mm. So you're not, we're not trying to sell a product so someone can see their partner's calendar. We're trying to solve um, for lack of clarity and friction because people ultimately want to have more connection and happier relationships. And so that's kind of the way that we talk to our customers. Mm. And how you like, so if we're... A lot of people listen to this podcast, so we're getting, I don't know, what is it, John? 25,000 downloads like in the first week now, right? 25,000 people are the largely busy people, right? Largely most, hopefully most of them in a happy relationship. Um, 
what benefit are they going to get from if they download Coupler right now and say, all right, I'm going to use this? So we're trying to just eliminate those sort of, you know, conversations that generate friction. So, um, you know, an example might be, you know, something's come up, we need to give an answer, um, but I can't get a hold of you because yeah. you're in meetings all day. And, um, and so, you know, in that instance, I could pick up my, the app and I could see but first of all, confirm the reason you're not answering your phone because you are in meetings all day. I can yeah. see that. Um, and then I can also see the free space where um, where I can go ahead and schedule that event. And I know that that's, you know, that can all get done without us needing to have a conversation. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's things like that. You know, if I want to contact my partner throughout the day, being able to check in and see is now a good time to call. Um, can I just go ahead and schedule that social event without having to have the conversation? Um, and then things like, you know, something that needs to be done over the weekend. And I know if I'm just going to ask, it might get forgotten about, but I can put a reminder in the app and then they're going to get an alert about it at an appropriate time yeah. um, and hopefully do the thing as well. Yeah. Um, and so it's just trying to eliminate those sort of niggly moments. Um, and I think, you know, avoiding things like double bookings or, you know, what really sort of gets relationships Um or makes those moments of unhappiness in relationships is when expectations aren't met. And so that's really what we try to solve for. Yeah, awesome. I think, um, like John and I were talking about it before, Like I, I personally love it when people put things in my diary because if it's not my diary, it just doesn't get done, yeah. right? And I think like communication is so, so important. So like if you can see that I've got some space there, fantastic, you know. I'm really curious to see the dating, the like fancy date thing again in New Zealand. I hope they get that goes back out into the wild. Yeah, I think we will test it in New Zealand. Um, we have come up with some other ways of um, pulling together all of you know the great date ideas. Um, AI is now you know much more prevalent than it was a couple of years ago, yeah. and so we we see ourselves using that to really help um, supercharge that content creation and you know get us to a place where um, we're able to push that out across the globe mm. um, without, you know, us having to touch everything, which is what we were doing last time. My, my brother, I'm from Melbourne, my brother's from Melbourne, ironically, he just moved to Auckland, but he... He, he used to be the guy that if you wanted to go on a date or on a first date, you'd ask him because he just always seemed to know what that nice spot was or like a place that you should, you know, this yeah. would be good. So it got to the point where like everyone would ask him all the time and he was like, oh, I'm just going to start a blog. So he started this blog, 50 First Dates Melbourne. And Amazing. And it blew up. Yeah. Like it, he was getting restaurants and bars and clubs and everything like giving, sending him vouchers to come out and, you know, like go to their spot to test it out. And it became so good. Like and he... I don't know if he ever finished and got to 50 first dates, but um, he got to 20 to 30 and they, it just went like wildfire. And a bit, but it was almost like a, a nice little story he'd put together. Like he'd say, start off here, it's you get in this laneway in Melbourne, knock on a door and a Japanese man is going to come out and bow to you and then you're in the, the hottest Japanese cocktail bar in Melbourne yeah. and then go for a walk through the park here into this. And I think, oh, how good. Yeah, like <laughs> something like that. I, I often looked in New Zealand, like I wonder if there's anything like that in New Zealand. There's, yeah. there's not been, you know, that's it's the what... what Date, what bar should we go and have a quick drink at this time right or yeah yeah 100 percent. and i think we all know someone like that in our network right who just is the person in the yeah. know um and i think you know that is something that we will try to put into coupler obviously what's going to be appealing for me and my circle might be different to someone else um but having a way of connecting with those key people that are in our um circle who know what those great ideas are um, and being able to surface those. So, you know, if I know that you've you've been on a great date recently, I can be like, hey, Troy, what was that place you went to? So I think there's an out, there's going to be an element of social sharing um, within the app as well. Mm, interesting. Would you, like if we go back to early before 2021, would you do it again? Like would you do, ex- do it exactly the same way if you didn't know? <laughs> Can I change it a little bit and yeah, make yeah. it less painful? Oh, well, we can, we'll, let's, we'll take COVID out, right? Let's take COVID yeah. out. You can have that. Yeah. Look, I, it's a hard one, right? Because um, I think we learned so much. I mean, there are parts, obviously, hindsight is twenty twenty, um, And there was parts of it in sort of what I call the pit of despair. Yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't yeah. want to repeat again. Yeah. But we had to go through it to get to the learnings um, yeah. and where we are now. So, you know. I'd, I'd say no, I wouldn't change it. Yeah, well, I feel like 
like to get revenue without doing huge marketing and like um like a couple's app from new zealand like selling like into the us you've got to give yourself some props right you've obviously done very well it's thank you i yeah. think that's one thing that we don't think about enough is like how well we've done and i think what you're going to find is with this podcast there's going to be 10 people that might hear this that are like fuck i'm in the pit of despair right now <laughs> <laughs> and there's yeah. if i had now just knowing that people are pushing forward and so what advice would you give them to keep going like what was your what, what was what was your reason for keeping going when it was like really really hard? We just believed in what we were doing so strongly. We knew that we weren't doing it the right going about it the right way, but we fundamentally believed in the problem. Mm. And I think falling in love with the problem. Um, great book, by the way, Yuri Levine. Um, definitely read it if mm -hmm. um, you haven't. But um, that falling in love with the problem and just being so desperate to solve it is you know what will keep you going forever yeah. um and for us that was so key when we were having those moments of despair we knew that the problem hadn't gone away it was just the way that we were looking at it was obviously wrong but we knew that there had to be a way so yeah. um and we felt the timing was right as well um there were a lot of positive indicators that we were right on the timing it was um, I mean, the timing as a whole, not the timing right yeah, at that yeah, moment, yeah, yeah. but the timing in a sense of, um, you know, dating apps, the stigma around using an app to find a relationship had gone. You know, there are sort of eight plus dating apps in the world that were worth more than a billion dollars. Um, and yet there are twice as many people in relationships than there are dating. So mm. it's sort of, you know, everything had started to make sense. And because we were so passionate about the problem, we, we just kind of knew yeah. um, that we had to keep going. And I think if we'd lost that knowing, um, that would have been the moment where we, where we, you know, threw the towel in. Yeah. And you mentioned books before. Like one thing I think when you, especially when you've got like a co-founder that's so close to home, right? You, you sometimes need an external mentor or you need external yeah. advice, right, to balance what you're getting from like your, your couple like you're in your own little bubble right did you seek out mentors or did you seek out knowledge of books or podcasts or yeah I'm an avid consumer of um, podcasts so um, I listen to How I Built This um, a lot of Tim Ferriss yeah. um, Diary of a CEO This Week Some in Startups yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so all of those um, and then I've we had a few books that I just kind of keep going back to one of them is Hooked yeah. um, and the name of the author escapes me now yeah. um, but that is like a bible for um, building um, you know um, building consumer products yeah. and sort of creating those products that customers keep coming back to um, yeah and and that fall in love with the problem again a great book yeah. um, so yeah there were just a few of those things um, and um, and podcasts where I got like enough out of that to sort of keep on the journey. And I think as well, really important is to hear other fa stories of failure from yeah. other founders as well, because yeah. it just really grounds you and, you know, you're okay. <laughs> I mean, like, in Melbourne, we used to do fuck up nights, like in the industry. And I, they were probably my favorite meetups to go to. It was just hearing people take on something crazy that I was like, whoa, I'd never would have done that, you know? And then to hear how close they got and then like it just didn't go, it didn't work out for timing yeah. or for whatever it was. But it just inspired me so much to hear people go after things, fail, live to tell the story, develop all these amazing skills and knowledge because of yeah. it. And then most of the time you see them, they're presenting at this failure fuck up night because they've been successful on their second or third thing. Yeah, and, amazing, right? And I think people are just too scared to get out of their comfort zone and try something. And like you just don't realize until you're there that you, once you start outside of your comfort zone, that's where, that's where the knowledge is. Like that's where yeah. the, the stuff that you're seeking is. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I mean, no one who's been successful hasn't failed a bunch of times, right? If you're not yeah. failing, you're probably not doing anything new. Um, and there's like, a, I kind of like to think of um, being in this space where you're just slightly afraid most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> it probably means you're pushing yourself far enough. If I'm not feeling that kind of ick feeling of like, oh, like, we well, just don't know if this is going to work or like feeling slightly uncomfortable, I know for me, I'm not when I'm not in the right space. So yeah, you're not growing, right? Yeah, you're not growing. Like yeah. you've got to be failing to build, um, you know, to find out what the thing is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So 
that's like I often talk about growing pains and I'm like, yeah. that's because you're growing. <laughs> yeah. that, that's because it's uncomfortable and that's because yeah. you're pushing past something. If a VC was listening to this and said, Erica, that's the thing, but that, that really is, I believe in it. And they said, all right, I'm prepared to chip in 10, 20, like for Series B, Series A. Like what, what do you spend that money on? We spend it on validating probably the next phase of the product a lot quicker than mm-hmm. what we're doing now. Um, we've got a fairly small development team, which has meant we've been able to be super nimble, but it, it just everything's, you know, taking longer yeah. than we would hope. And obviously that's, you know, a startup's constant battle is you just want to go faster. Yeah. And so I think there would be the opportunity to get fa- go faster and get out to market quicker. And then with consumer, it's marketing, right? Yeah. So, you know, um, these other big consumer brands, they're spending a hell of a lot on marketing, um, you know, more money than I've ever seen in my life. And and so I think when we, when we understood that we had the product where we needed it to be, um, you know, the plan is always to turn the marketing tap on. But there's a lot of like green shoots or, you know, sort of points of validation that we'd get before we did that because otherwise you can just be pouring money down the drain. So mm. I think it would be about getting – you know, we want to see evidence of word of mouth growth um, and real evidence of like a network effect. And then at that stage, we're going to turn the tap on. Yeah. But it seems like obviously most of, you, most of it's come through word of mouth so far or finding it in the right places, right? And so- yeah, there's definitely, um, yeah, we know that from our customer interviews. Um, people are telling their friends about it or they're finding out or some of the people that we interviewed had found out about it from friends. So we've already got that to some degree. Um, mm. We just need to start seeing it at, at a bigger scale. Yeah, interesting. I feel like it'd be interesting fast forwarding two years to see where you're on, like get you back in two years to see where it's at now. Like it feels feel to me you're at the precipice of something that could be really like just blow up really quickly. I hope so. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so I do too. I think I think the problem's great, you know, like that. the problem you're trying to solve is there and I think the product, you know, definitely is something that I would use like going forward if I wanted to be in a happy relationship, which, which we all do. And I think the world is becoming a little bit more like socially aware of like how we need to self-improve and to be in a great relationship I think you need to be really conscious of like self-improving and and looking after each other and supporting each other and so absolutely mm. yeah what do you think through your research makes for a great relationship you know I think I think the thing I mentioned before about expectations um you know that usually any sort of um disappointment is a gap between um, what you expected and what actually happened. Yeah. Um, and so I think managing expectations is is super key. You know, outside of the things that we can control, um, there's got to be a mutual respect for one another, um, you know, first and foremost. And I'm not, I don't think that's something that necessarily a couple will address, but um, yeah, that mutual respect um, and just wanting to have, a, have fun together yeah. um, and have a laugh and being able to, um, not take yourselves too seriously. Yeah, awesome. Well, this has been fun. We need to wrap up now with a couple of questions. Yeah. And so um, there is a previous question that I'm going to ask you. That the So I'm on season four. We are asking – I'm going to get you to give me a question that we're going to give to the next guest, and I've got one to give to you from the previous guest. And the previous guest was Connor at Tracksuit. And so he said – Fast forward five years, which feels relevant now after chatting with you. Fast forward five years, where are you and where's your business? Yeah, so um, Coupler will be the most widely used uh, relationship app in the world. Um, And we see ourselves being used by millions of couples uh, globally to create, you know, that extra happiness and connection in their relationships. We will have started something um, in terms of creating an ecosystem for Um, consumer apps out of New Zealand. I think there are a lot of really amazing founders um, in New Zealand that need more support to sort of go and build that, you know, that consumer brand or that consumer um, product. And I would love to be um, at the forefront of helping create that um, community. What do you like? I'm going to add an extra question. What what do you think we can do better as an ecosystem to support the sort of consumer space? Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one, right? Because it's, I think the best support comes from people that have done it before. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I've definitely found the conversations that we've had with people that where this is their bread and butter is just so different to someone who's attacking at it from a B2B 
side of things, yeah. even if they're trying to be, you know, the most helpful or um, accommodating sort of, you know, mentor or person that they can be to the founder. It's, it's just, just the conversation the is different. Yeah. And so I think this is going to get something that's going to be built over time. Um, and I think everyone who is building a B2C business has a role to play in sort of creating that, um, you know, community and ecosystem for the next generation. Yeah. Well, you're, you're obviously... Um like super determined to do an events business and, and then now a consumer app. It's like some big challenges, but I love it. And I really hope that like for success by couple and I think there will be. Do you have a question that you would like to ask our next guest not knowing who they are? Yeah. Um, I will ask um, what sets you apart from your peers in the industry that you're in? Awesome. All right. We'll pass that on to the next guest. What now, if you were to answer that same question, what sets you apart from your peers in the industry that you're in? Probably a blindness to do um, do the thing even without knowing really what we're getting into and I think just sheer determination. Um, I think there's, a, yeah, I think there's a lot of people that get afraid of doing things because they don't know how to do the thing, you know, at every kind of step of my career and in what I did with Symphony beforehand, I didn't know how to do that either. But I was determined to do it and, f and find a way. And I think in this space, um, that's what set, has set me apart, yeah. Awesome, awesome chatting. I really love chatting with you. It's- um, Love chatting with you too. Yeah, it was cool, <laughs> it was cool. And I really like, I, I, I think the future, like that would be, that that could be closer than we think, right? Than five years, like to have like relationships using this app across the world. Like it feels like we're at the precipice of something because that I don't know what, you, what was that study you said. How many people will find themselves? Forty percent of people found themselves on dating apps, and then like the amount of people now that are sort of exposed to going forward, like continuing to use themselves. I just see that it's such a huge market. Yeah, and life's getting busier, right? We're um you know, we love to fill up our, our time with as many things as we can. And so it's always a juggling act, um, you know, and tools have helped us solve so many problems that we've come across with work and communication and that kind of thing. So it's only natural um, that that moves into the relationship space. Yeah, awesome. So Coupler, C-U-P-L-A. Correct. Yeah, and people can go and download it on the App Store. Yep. Or check out your website, which we've got on display right now. Perfect. Hey, thanks so much for coming in, Erica. See you next time. See ya. I really hope that I get Erica back on the podcast in two years time I think that she's gonna have a fucking amazing story to tell over the next two years like super passionate I love seeing founders just go for it I love seeing founders you know like push themselves out of their comfort zones out of what she what I think she said the the like abyss of despair or the valley of despair and push forward no matter what just because she absolutely knows she's solving, solving a fundamental problem for relationships and couples and I think she is and I I'm truly inspired by chatting with her I hope you were too thank you so much for watching or listening this is the time now where if you're still with us look I really ask you jump down and hit follow if you're on Spotify or hit subscribe if you're on YouTube it helps us to attract sponsors it helps us to grow it helps us to get bigger and better guests each time and so thank you so much for everything so far i hope to see you on the next episode until then i'm troy you've been watching the we fucking love startups podcast this podcast is produced by jono tucker from empire films